Today is going to be an exploration of Taylor's theorem. Does that mean we also think about Taylor polynomials and Taylor series? Yes, at least Taylor polynomials are part of Taylor's theorem. And you can apply Taylor's theorem to Taylor series to, for example, prove convergence of Taylor series to the function you're trying to approximate in certain situations. But that's not really the main focus here. What does Taylor's theorem say? I'm not going to write out the complete theorem by hand here. We will look at it in the book, but let me just write the main equation and talk about the idea. You've got some function f that's going to be a nice function on some interval. What do we mean that by nice? That's a technical hypothesis. Uh, if we, When we look at the theorem, we'll see that f will be n times continuously differentiable, cn. And actually, the n plus first derivative will also have to exist, but not necessarily be continuous. I mean, it could be continuous, but it's not a necessary hypothesis of the theorem. And it says, for any positive integer n, and even n equals 0, we can break f of x down into the sum of two pieces, pnx plus rnx, where this, the pnx, <clears throat> excuse me, is the so-called nth degree Taylor polynomial. And it is a polynomial. And the rnx is sometimes called the remainder term. You could also think of it as the, i.e., error in using pnx to approximate f of x. The actual function f of x that we're interested in is a polynomial approximation plus some error term called r, because it's also like a remainder in a sense, though not the usual sense of a remainder as a division. It's whatever's left over is the idea of the remainder there. And P and X and R and X do have formulas. We are expanding in a Taylor polynomial about some point, often called A or C in calculus books, but in our book called X sub zero. You've got the constant term f of x sub zero, and this pen is not working so well. Let's try another one. f of x sub zero, there's your constant term, plus the linear term in x, which is the derivative of f at x zero times x minus x zero, plus the quadratic term, which is the second derivative of f evaluated at x zero divided by two, but you write it as two factorial because we, we're gonna see a pattern. This one also could be thought of as divided by one factorial. And this one is can be thought of as divided by zero factorial because zero factorial and one factorial are one, right? Zero factorial is one by definition because it makes formulas like this work out nicely times x minus x zero squared plus dot, dot, dot. This is going to be an nth degree polynomial. The nth degree term is going to be the nth derivative of f. This notation means nth derivative. So if n is one, it's the first derivative. If n is two, it's a second. If n is three, it's a third derivative at x zero divided by n factorial times x minus x zero to the nth power. This entire thing is pnx. But what's the remainder term? Let's use a different color. Plus the remainder term, the remainder term, is that a bunch of terms as well? No, it's just a single term. It's the n plus first derivative of f evaluated somewhere that I'm not going to say yet. 
divided by n plus one factorial times x minus x zero to the n plus first power. Looking at this as is makes you think, hey, I guess this is still a polynomial because it's raised to the n plus first power there. But no, it's actually not a polynomial. And the reason it's not a polynomial is because there's a function of x that goes inside the parentheses here. And it's using my favorite Greek letter, C of x. Mm -hmm. Squiggle of x, C. C of x, which is again, fun to make fast and fun to make slow. C of x. C of x, what is that? It's some unspecified function of x. And it doesn't have to be a polynomial. Could be something really weird for all you know. It's getting plugged into the n plus first derivative of f. And f, by the way, doesn't have to be a polynomial either. Common examples for f of x are like e to the x, cosine of x, sine of x, square root of one plus x. The f of x doesn't have to be a polynomial. We usually apply this theorem to functions that are not polynomials. And yeah, we don't know what c of x is. We're just plugging it into that n plus first derivative, which exists but is not necessarily continuous, though usually it would be. There's something else to say. C of x is between, C of x is between, has a value between x zero and x, no matter what x is on the interval on which f is n times continuously differentiable and has an n plus first derivative. Wow, what a theorem. Is there any intuition in this theorem? Uh, yeah, well, that's what we're gonna work toward. It's certainly difficult to think about as is. Do notice that if X is close to X zero, like really close, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001 apart, that difference is gonna be small. And when you raise a small number close to zero to a large power, this is gonna be small. Now that derivative could be a large number, but maybe it's not super large. Maybe in fact, the derivative is bounded on whatever, whatever interval you're talking about. You're dividing by a large number, n plus one factorial. In general, when n is large, this is a small quantity, if your interval at least is bounded at least. And if you apply this stuff to the cosine and sine function, it's definitely small because cosine and sine have derivatives that are always themselves and never get bigger than one in absolute value. And so you, you end up with a small remainder typically when n is large and especially when x is close to x zero. So that's good. That would mean intuitively that Pn of x is a good approximation for f of x. Let me rewrite f of x here as well. When n is large, as long as x is not too far away from x zero. All right, so let's try to get some intuition about this by thinking about some examples. Let's start with an example where f of x actually is a polynomial, a fairly simple polynomial. f of x equals x to the fourth. I'm going to give you the example x cubed as part of your homework, so you might say I'm doing a slightly harder example. Uh, it is worth mentioning here that if uh, x zero is zero, well, all that this stuff is very easy. If x zero is zero for this particular function, well then p zero of x is um, f of zero is zero. It's the zero function. And r zero of x would be actually x to the fourth itself. I know that's weird to think about. Um, and I don't want to go into details. You, the, essentially, the, the polynomial is not doing a very good job of approximating the function when, when n is small. Ultimately, if you kept going, p4 of x would be x to the fourth itself. p1 of x, p2 of x, p3 of x, that all be the zero function with the same remainder. p4 of x would approximate it perfectly, and r4 of x would be zero. When x zero is something other than zero, 
it's a little bit more interesting, though in the end, once you get to P4 of X, it's still going to be a perfect approximation. Um, let's pick something other than zero. Let's pick X zero to be one to make this a little bit more interesting here. So we're trying to approximate this, say, this fourth degree polynomial, a simple fourth degree polynomial with lower degree polynomials. Sounds a little strange. Why would you need to do that? Because that's a simple function. But we're doing it for the purposes of illustration. So what's P0 of X? That's, again, the zeroth degree polynomial approximation. That's just the function value at X0. That's just F of 1, which is 1. We're using the constant function one to approximate x to the fourth near one. So here is x to the fourth. Kind of looks like a parabola, though it is flatter near the origin than a parabola is. Uh, and goes up faster as you get further away. One is right here, say. We're approximating the function value with a constant function. Does a perfect approximation at one, but not so good as you move away from one. What would the remainder be? You can, if you want, always think of the remainder in another way. You can solve this equation for the remainder to say the remainder is the function we're trying to approximate minus the approximation. It is like an error term, actual minus approximate. Remember, error is actual minus approximate. It goes in alphabetical order. F of X is the actual. PN of X is the approximation. RN of X is like an error. I, I can always think that way if I want. So R0 of X is the actual function minus the approximation. So in this case, for this example, that is X to the fourth minus one. What does the graph of R0 of X look like? We're taking the uh, actual function, that's the X to the fourth, and subtracting the approximation, the constant function one. Over here, we get a positive value, positive values for the difference. And over here, you get negative values. This would be the graph of R0 of X near X equals one. This is the number one here. Okay. Uh, how do we relate this to Taylor's theorem? Taylor's theorem says that this also equals, here n is, n is zero here, we're doing the case where n is zero, that you can write the uh, remainder term also as the derivative. In this case, it's the first derivative because if n is zero, n plus one is one. At x zero, which is one, excuse me, it's a mistake first derivative at C of X divided by one factorial times X minus X zero to the first power. If N is one, N plus one is one. If N is zero, N plus one is one. What's F prime? Well, F of X is X to the fourth. So F prime of X is four X cubed. So F prime of C of X, I guess, would be 4 C of X cubed. I guess what we're saying, according to Taylor's theorem, is C of X is the function that makes this equal to this. So I guess I could solve for C of X. Will you always be able to solve for C of X? Not always. Oh, what happened? There we go. Okay. Not always, but at least here we can. I guess we'd have to divide both sides by four and divide by X minus one as well. So C of X cubed would be X to the fourth minus one over four times X minus one. Um, Guess take the cube root, but before I take the cube root, I can actually simplify this. X minus one actually divides into X to the fourth minus one. They both have a root at one. Oh, we can do synthetic division. More fun with synthetic division. 
one zero zero fourth degree, third degree, second degree, first degree, first degree, constant term. So a quick synthetic division here to divide x to the fourth minus one by x minus one. One's a root of x to the fourth minus one. Bring that one down, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add. Got a zero at the end. These numbers, all ones, are the coefficients of the quotient. The remainder is zero. Bring the divide by four out as a one fourth, say, and the quotient is x cubed plus x squared plus x plus one. I guess that is c of x cubed. And so c of x itself must be the cube root of that. So in this example, we can actually solve for the c of x. Now you don't typically need to solve for the c of x, but I just wanted to illustrate that you could. In most problems, you don't actually need to solve typically for c of x. Uh, where's my Mathematica here? Let's let's con let's confirm some things here. for this example. So f of x here for this example is again, x to the fourth, x zero we're taking to be one. I could type in a general nth degree Taylor polynomial in the Mathematica using an arbitrary n and using the x zero. I think I won't do that just for the sake of keeping things simple. The p zero of x is just f of x zero which is the constant function, one. R zero of x is the actual function minus the approximation. What's a simplified formula for R zero of x? It's x to the fourth minus one. We already saw that. And I could go ahead and plug in C of X. Hey, Mathematica made a C. Uh, kind of like in the Calc 1 project, you got to use the cube root thing to allow yourself to be able to take cube roots of negative numbers and get negative outputs instead of complex number outputs in Mathematica here. This evidently is the C of X function. And I don't know if mathematics is going to be able to simplify this or not, but let's try. According to what we've got here, if I simplify 4c of x cubed times x minus 1, I should get x to the fourth minus 1. Let's see if that happens. Let's see how Mathematica handles it. Simplify 4c of x. I made the c, by the way, by doing escape x escape cubed times x minus one. There we have it. It did simplify to that. And it is always between x zero, which is one, and x. You could actually plot it. You could plot x zero, again, which is one. So we'll see a horizontal line at one. You can plot x, arbitrary x. And you could plot c of x, close to one, say, I mean, maybe even not necessarily close to one. Let's go negative 10 to 10. And let's make the colors clear. Plot style. Let's make the horizontal line red, the uh, slanted line blue, and C of X, let's make green. There we go. The C of X function is always between the red and blue graphs. It's always between X0, one in this case, and uh, X itself, the blue line. Right. This is not the graph of f of x or the graph of p n of x or the graph of r n of x. It's the graph. I'm trying to illustrate that c of x is always between x zero and x is what I'm trying to illustrate. And yes, c of x is a function. By the way, you can do this kind of problem and you can try to solve for c for given values of x as well. Um, for example, <clears throat> you could find the actual excuse me, the approximation to this function at x equals 1.5 and the remainder term value at 1.5. You can think of all these things with numbers instead, okay? 
Maybe we should quickly do that. We did a much more general approach. You know, P zero of, you could say F zero, sorry, F of 1.5 is approximately P zero of 1.5. This is a dumb approximation, of course, because it's just a constant function is one. R of 1.5 is the actual value minus the approximation, R0 of 1.5. It's 1 1.5 to the fourth minus one. Not a very good approximation. 1.5 to the fourth is 5.0625. The error is 4.0625. Not a very good approximation at 1.5 here. And you could set the, you know, if you were, if I asked you to figure out what C is when X is 1.5, you could set this equal to, um, set this equal to four C cubed times 1.5 minus one, not specifying that C does depend on X there. And solve for C, I'm, I'm re really using this expression here, but I'm I'm treating C as a fixed number instead of a function of X. Uh, this is 0. 0.5, four times 0. 0.5 is two. So we get two C cubed. And I can solve for the value of C now by dividing both sides by two and then taking the cube root, the equality between those things. Divide both sides by two. My calculator subtract one, divide by two, then take a cube root. C is about 1.2665, or I guess I rounded incorrectly there, four. And that should be the same number you'd get if you plugged x equals 1.5 into that function. Should we try it? Okay, let's go ahead and try it. Plug in 1.5 for x into that function. 1.5 cubed plus 1.5 squared plus 1.5 plus one, all divided by four. Take the cube root. Yep, same number. So more typically people just do, do it simpler. But I want to illustrate the theorem. So I'm trying to show you, you can actually even figure out what C of X is as a function sometimes. Let's continue the same example here, but now let's go up to a first degree polynomial, a linear approximation and see what happens. So now we're after P one of X. That would be F of X zero, F of one plus f prime of x zero, f prime of one divided by one factorial, doesn't change it, times x minus x zero to the first power. This is supposed to be an x here. x minus one to the first power. f of one we've already seen is one. f prime of one is four, right? Because f prime of x is four x cubed. You know, we are doing essentially calculus here, but I'm talking about higher level ideas at the same time here. Just like Calc 2 Taylor polynomials. So there's P1 of X. You can, you know, it's when you're trying to use this to approximate the function near one, it's better to leave it like this. Though, can you, of course, you can expand it if you like, in this case, to 4X minus 3. But it's better to leave it like that when you're trying to use it to approximate the function. What's R1 of X going to be? The remainder is the actual function minus the approximation. So that in this case is going to be X to the fourth minus in parentheses 4X minus three. So if you simplify that, that is X to the fourth minus 4X plus three, that is the remainder term. It's also supposed to, by Taylor's theorem, be equal to the following. Go ahead and set this equal. To, I'm going to try to solve for C of X again. 
set this equal to the second derivative of f at the unknown function c of x divided by two factorial times x minus one squared. Again, x is zero is one. What's f double prime of x? It's 12 x squared. So I need to plug C of X into that in place of X. 12 C of X quantity squared divided by two factorial is 12 C of X quantity squared divided by two, which then becomes six times C of X squared. And, and still don't forget the X minus one squared. Again, my goal here is to solve for C of X. I'm trying to illustrate the theorem. I'm not trying to prove the theorem. The proof of the theorem is just too hard. I'm trying to illustrate it. So I'm gonna set these things equal to each other and solve for C of X. So C of X squared would be the fourth degree thing divided by six and also x minus one squared. Hmm, I wonder whether synthetic division can help us simplify again. Here, let's see. Maybe x minus one is a factor of x to the fourth minus four x plus three. In fact, you think about it quickly, it would have to be, right? Because if you plug in one up there, you're gonna get zero. One minus four plus three. So do a quick synthetic division, so much fun. Add, multiply, add, multiply, add. A bunch of ones again, multiply. Oh, here's something that's not one. Negative three, multiply, add. We get a zero, yay. And maybe, maybe I can simplify further. Maybe X minus one's a, maybe one's a double root of that thing. Do synthetic division again with what's left over here. One, 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 one. Uh, or maybe not. I was thinking it would be. Oh, thank, thank you. I forgot to. <laughs> I was too thinking I had zeros there. Okay, yeah. There we go. Yeah, I got a zero again. One is a double root of x to the fourth minus four x plus three. It's a double root of the remainder function. Interesting. I wonder if that's a coincidence. No, it's not. Anyway, this simplifies then according to this division to one sixth times the quadratic with these coefficients x squared plus two x plus three. So I guess take the square root of both sides now. I guess C of X is the square root of this thing. Maybe we should allow for plus or minus square root. By the way, the, in the homework that I assigned, at least on one problem that I'll assign, you won't be doing this in general. You'll, you'll be doing the simpler kind of approach where you've got a particular value of X you're thinking about. But I think this is fun. So I'm, I'm kind of enjoying doing it this way. <laughs> So this is supposed to be the C of X, maybe just the plus square root or maybe just the minus square root or maybe both. Well, maybe we should plot it to C and maybe we should make more, more plots than just that plot. Um, so P one of X is F of X zero plus F prime of X zero times X minus X zero simplify p1 of x, there it is, 4x minus 3. r1 of x is actual function minus the approximation. It is a polynomial in this case because the original function is a polynomial. We will, I will try to apply this right after we're done here with this example to a cosine, maybe the sine function. And then f of x is not a polynomial and r of x is also not a polynomial. What if we plot, so let's make a couple different plots here. Let's plot 
f of x, p1 of x, and r1 of x near one this time. So we're gonna see how the linear approximation, how well it does, so to speak. So the red graph is x to the fourth. The blue graph, the linear approximation, that's the linear function, four x minus three. The green graph is the error, the remainder. Notice the remainder has a zero slope at x zero, at one. It's acting like a quadratic in a sense. It's not a quadratic, but it's kind of acting like one. Intuitively, that's why when we divided by x minus one squared, we were able to cancel completely. We were able to simplify this to a polynomial intuitively. So that's illustrating the approximation as well as the error. What about the other kind of plot? Where I plot C of X along with X zero and X, but I need a new C of X now. Maybe I should have called this C zero of X. Uh, a new C of X, let's try the square root. Now, I'll try the positive square root first x squared plus 2x plus 3 over 6. <clears throat> C of x is the green graph. It's between the red and blue graphs. It's between x0 and x. Certainly when x is bigger than 1, and when x is between neg uh, 1 and maybe negative 3 or so. But once x is less than negative 3, it doesn't seem to work anymore. Oh, well, maybe that's because maybe it's negative C of X that works in that case. And by that, I mean the negative square root, which would be, an, you could also call that C of X. Spelled magenta wrong. There we go. That C of X is not between the red and blue until x is less than negative 0.7 or so. And once the green one is not between the red and the blue, the magenta one still is. So I guess the C of x is definitely the green one over here and in here. Both of them in here, there's two C of x's that work in there. But once you're to the left of negative three, then it's only the pink one, the negative square root that works. Interesting, okay. Last example today, let's apply, I, I could go on and do higher degrees thing, things as well. Same ideas would apply. Last example today, let's do for the sine function. Let's let f of x be sine of x. And we'll let x zero be zero this time. It's still interesting enough. You gotta take the derivatives to find the Taylor polynomials. Of course, with sine and cosine, once you get to like the fourth derivative, you're back to where you started. And then the cycle repeats. It's almost like a cyclic group or something. Mm. Well, no, forget I said that. F of zero is sine of zero is zero. F prime of zero is cosine of zero is one. F double prime of zero is zero. F triple prime of zero is negative one, f quadruple prime of zero is zero, then it goes one, neg zero, negative one, zero, one, zero, negative one, zero, et cetera. I could keep going. Let's think about uh, P3x, third degree Taylor polynomial. It's gonna turn out after you use the formula, you'll get, you've seen this before, x minus x cubed over three factorial, right? Because the Taylor series starts that way and then the next term is plus x to the fifth over five factorial, then minus x to the seventh over seven factorial. You should remember this from Calc 2. You really should remember Taylor expansions your entire life if you're a math major. 
right? You shouldn't forget these things. You shouldn't. If you have, well, work at it. Even when you're 80. Okay, by the way, since, since the next term would be x to the fifth over five factorial, p4 of x would actually be the same as p3 of x, which could little, lead to a little confusion with applying Taylor's theorem, but uh, let's not worry about that for the moment. That's p3, that we can simplify that to x minus one, six x cubed. R3 of x, since f is not a polynomial, r is not gonna be a polynomial either. This is going to be sine of x minus this is going to be minus x plus one sixth x cubed. So you might think maybe the c of x is just impossible to find here, but no, it actually is possible to find. If I set this equal to the fourth derivative at the unknown function c of x over four factorial, times x minus x zero to the fourth power. Remember x zero is zero. So I can just write x to the fourth. I can still solve for xi of x here. What's the fourth derivative? It's sine of x. So the fourth derivative evaluated at xi of x is in fact xi of x. I want to set these equal and solve for C of X. I know by the theorem that there's got to be a C of X function that makes this work. So do the solving. Uh, multiply both sides by 24, divide both sides by X to the fourth. This implies the sign of C of X would be 24 sine X minus 24 x plus 4x cubed, right? Because 24 times 1 6 is 4. All divided by x to the fourth. And would this mean, maybe big question mark here, that c of x is the inverse sine of that thing? Arc sine? Is that really what C of X is going to be? Well, I'm not going to prove it perhaps, but let's see if Mathematica makes it reasonable. <clears throat> and let's do everything again. So F of X now is sine of X. We've got a P3 of X is X minus X cubed over six. R3 of X is the original function, F of X minus the approximation. And again, you'll be doing this, this often, or maybe not real often for your homework, just with particular values of X. But I'm thinking about this for arbitrary X's. Now let's go ahead and put C of X. Let's try seeing if the arc sine function works. Mathematica inverse sine is arc sine. What could possibly keep this from working? Well, you might wonder whether the thing in, that I'm taking the arc sine of is between negative one and one, no matter what x is, because the domain of the arc sine function is between negative one and one, right? Because sine values are between negative one and one. So that's the, the range of the sine function. So the arc sine function should have a domain between negative one and one. You might wonder, is this always going to be between negative one and one, no matter what x is? That's not so clear. So let's plot plot some things here and just see what we see. Ones to threes. I'm approximating near zero. Let's try just negative neg negative two pi to positive two pi and see what we see. So let's see, the red graph is the sign. The blue graph is the third degree Taylor polynomial, closely approximating the red graph near zero. And the green graph is the error, red graph minus blue graph, slightly positive to the right of zero, then it gets larger and larger positive as you move further away from zero. 
and negative to the left of zero, it looks kind of like a cubic near zero, though it's not a cubic. R3 is not a cubic. It's a trig function combined with a polynomial. It just looks like a cubic. <clears throat> you might wonder, uh, could we take the equality between these two things and divide just by x to the fourth and somehow cancel out the x to the fourth? Maybe, I, I'm a little confused about what I just said there, but let's not worry about it at the moment. And let's see if c of x is always between x zero and, and x, although I need to change x zero now to zero. Oops, zero. Uh, and I don't have a negative C of X anymore. It is. It's the green graph. It's always between the red and blue, no matter what X is. I guess the input to the arc sign here is always between negative one and one, though I could plot. Well, I might as well just go ahead and plot that to confirm it. I get a 10 to 10 even. Is it always between negative one and one? It is. That's the input for the inverse sine. So I can always take the inverse sine of it. Anyway, so that's an exploration of Taylor's theorem. Next time we're going to get into chapter three, and you read about this a little bit, Lagrange interpolating polynomials. Taylor's, Taylor polynomials approximate functions near X zero. Interpolation is about approximating functions over wider ranges. Was there a question? Oh, how does it work if x equals zero? Is that going to be divided by? Uh, it's probably a removable discontinuity. Probably what happens. Yeah. All right. Have a good day.